It's Friday, May 22nd. We're studying 2 Peter. We're in 2 Peter chapter 2. We've got a very challenging verse today, so let's look at it. You'll get a little of the context here. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse number 18, talks about the fact that they were loud boasting, uh, speaking loud boast of folly. Um, verse 19, they promised freedom, but they themselves, as we saw yesterday, slaves of corruption. Get that proverbial statement at the end of verse 19, whatever overcomes a person to that, he is enslaved. Now here's our verse for today, verse 20, speaking of being enslaved. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they again are entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. And then it goes on to say it'd be better for them had they ever known the way, they had never known the way of truth, the way of righteousness rather, than having known it, uh, than after knowing it, to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. I right, might as well read the rest of verse 22. The tr- what the true proverb says has happened to them, a dog returns to its own vomit, and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. So we have this defection, um, without injecting too much interpretation already, the, we have an apostasy here, and that's the picture. But the real question in our verse, right here, verse 21, uh, I'm sorry, verse 20, rather. If after they have escaped the, uh, the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they again are entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become, as we'll see here, returning back after having all this knowledge, has become worse for them than the first. So let's understand a few things here that are very important. And the first thing is the pronoun. Let's look at verse 20 here. For if after they, right, who are we talking about? Who are we talking about? Well, there are three groups of people that we've been talking about in chapter 2. There are the false teachers, there are those that are potentially and are being enticed by them, and then there are the people, hopefully, that Peter is successfully warning and they're being stable and strong. So let's think, first of all, about these unsteady souls. This is the context, verse number 14, they have eyes full of adultery, the they here is the false teachers, insatiable for sin, they, the false teachers, entice unsteady souls. So that enticement of unsteady souls is the problem. Okay, and then it goes on to talk about the false teachers again. So we don't want them enticing the unsteady souls. Verse 18, uh, another example of this. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice, there's our word again, by sensual, passion, by sensual passions of the flesh, those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. And as we looked at that a couple days ago, we saw we're talking about the neophytes here, the new converts, the people that are not steady souls. They're not, they don't have their faith grounded. They're not growing well enough. They become victims of this false teaching. Okay. So we could, we could be talking about they, the people that are being enticed, which he's hoping Peter in his writing that that is not true of everyone in the church, that they are learning to guard themselves. Or we could be talking about what is In the context, primarily, starting in verse number one, as the false prophets arose among the people, Old Testament example, just as there will be false teachers among you. So we know that most of what we've been studying here has been about about the false teachers. They secretly bring in their destructive heresies, destructive heresies, destroying, setting back the unsteady, the unstable, the people that are being enticed by their teaching. Uh, even denying the master who bought them. We talked about that, you might remember, which will help you understand where I'm going today if you think back to that. Verse 19, uh, they promise freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. So we know that they're just really engrossed in the things that they're really not freed from. They end up going back to the kinds of things that they've done. And so we know that they're hypocritical for whatever comes a person to that he's enslaved. So that's the immediate context. I'm going to argue that in this passage, the they is not the people being enticed, certainly not the people he's directly teaching to and writing to here, uh, but it is the false teachers. So they, the false teachers, have escaped the defilements in the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and then are entangled in them and overcome the last state of them, the false teachers, has become worse for them than the first. So the question becomes, how in the world can this be true? Um, and, and let me say another reason why I think it's they, and I didn't show you this screen, but I should. Here's one of the reasons. I don't see um, 
I do not see Peter using this kind of language and enlisting this proverb to describe the unsteady souls who are just not grounded enough in their faith or too, uh, they're too much of a neophyte in the faith to resist this false teaching. Because he then applies this proverb in the next verse, or two verses from now, verse 22, and says the Proverbs, what the proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to his own vomit, and the sow, the pig, after washing, returns to wallow in the mire. So to call them pigs and dogs here, uh, which is as insulting then as it is now, uh, although I guess not as insulting uh, to us to call someone a dog, because people love their dogs, but uh, in their day at least, the pigs and the dogs, that's a bad thing. And, and that's the kind of thing that says, listen, that's who they are, they're dogs and they're pigs, and they return to the stuff that they used to be involved in. They start licking up their vomit and they start wallowing in the, in the mud. That is, I think, determinative in helping me now know what the challenge is in this passage. And the challenge is, look at the passage here, the highlighted section, right? If they've escaped the defilements in the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, how can they do that? How does that work? How do false teachers uh, escape that? I mean, if, if, they're, if, if they're Christians, how do they escape that? Well, the word escape, which by the way is one reason some people say, well, it must be those that are being enticed because it's used that same word they've escaped, right? Uh, recently gotten out of their non-Christian life. Well, I'm going to say the non-Christian false teachers who are headed to perdition and destruction, they are, uh, they've escaped too many of the defilements, not all of them clearly because they're hypocritical, but enough for them not to be the obvious wolf, but the wolf in sheep's clothing by being a part of the church which is the description here in Hebrews chapter 6. And, and he talks about here the impossibility of again uh, being um, brought to repentance in, in, in the point of that this, this ability to identify with the visible church as the tares or the weeds, as Jesus said in the parable, and yet not be genuine, and yet you have a lot of benefits in this. And here's a list of benefits in Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 4. In the case of those, here's a group of people, which I think is going to uh, parallel not just false teachers, but several people in the church that just sit there week after week and take in a lot of the biblical stuff as a part of the identifiable church. Uh, they've once been enlightened. Look at the words here. They've tasted heavenly gift. They've shared in the Holy Spirit. They've tasted the goodness of the Word of God. They've tasted, implied here, the powers of the age to come. Uh, I, I, I tried to distinguish the difference between being in the church and really being of the church with the sense that you can say, well, I've been enlightened. Well, there's a lot of people that get a lot of new insights sitting in church and they're helpful insights. Uh, but there's a difference between being uh, a person who gets new insights as an unregenerate person, who in our case in Second Peter becomes a false teacher, or being a new person, new insights versus being a new person, or this heavenly gift, tasting the heavenly gift. Well, there are certainly some who have had some new blessings because of their Christianity. I think of people that uh, you know send their kids to Sunday school and they get involved in you know a Bible study and their wife gets involved in a Bible study and they've, they've certainly tasted the heavenly gift, the things that God brings through identification with the people of God. And yet they're not captivated by God's grace. There's a lot of blessing, but they're not really taken captive in the place where their hearts are completely the Lord's. They've shared in the Holy Spirit. So we think, well, how can that be? It was like in the Old Testament, they had a lot of people that shared in all of the good things that the Spirit did. Uh, the Spirit brought conviction for sin. The Spirit brought prompting to do right. There's certain things that the Spirit of God brings externally on people. Think about conviction. Some people coming to church and sitting through uh, things in the church for years have a whole set of convictions that really come from the Spirit's work in the community, but they really don't have the residence of the Spirit in their life or tasted the goodness of the Word of God. I mean, clearly, you can taste the goodness of the Word of God and not really have an obedience and, and, and a submission to the Word of God. There's a lot of people picking and choosing in the salad bar, so to speak, of the, of the Bible, and they like this, and they like that, and they like this verse. I mean, you see it all the time, that kind of selective nature of Bible study, and they really are not those submitted to the whole of the Bible. If there's a part they don't like, they're not interested in that part. Or tasted, it's inferred here again, the verb, the powers of the age to come. Well, certainly in the first century there, you saw a lot of people seeing a lot of things like Judas, seeing Jesus do miracles firsthand, seeing all kinds of things happen in his very presence. I mean, people raised from the dead. Uh, he certainly had tasted the powers of the age to come, and yet 
Judas is a good example of one not being transformed by that power from the inside out. So there's lots of examples, I think, of people escaping a lot of things, the defilement in the world, because really when it comes to their lives, they're not in the world anymore. They're sitting in churches. They're part of the church fellowships. They're part of the church body. They're part of the visible church, but they're really not part of the church as regenerate people. Uh, and I think that's really important. And a lot of that comes through all the stuff they learn in the Bible, all the stuff they learn that's taught through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And they call him Lord, Lord, as we saw in Matthew 7, but they're not converted. And the reason this can be, uh, and uh, by the way, and just to give you some uh, interpretation here of Hebrews 6, look at verse number 7 here in, in Hebrews 6. Um, it says, the land that drunk the rain that often falls on it. Certainly that happens in the church. There's a deluge in some churches of good things that come down on those people, both saved and unsaved, uh, and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it was cultivated. In this case, God receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, right, which is got a lot of plastic fruit, looks good on the outside, but really their hearts are unchanged. And out of their life comes a lot of the duplicity and hypocrisy that we saw in 2 Peter as we examine the false teachings, uh, the false teachers' lives. So, well, then that is worthless, right? That person, the land in this case, that person is worthless and near being cursed, soon will be cursed. And its end, it will be burned, right? It is to be burned. And then he says, though we speak in this way, we know he's not talking about Christians here. Uh, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things. What kind of things? Things that belong to salvation. So think back to the passage here when it talks about these people that have been enlightened, tasted the heavenly gift, shared in the Holy Spirit, tasted the goodness of the Word of God, powers of the age to come. These people fall away. They're apostate, right? Impossible, it says, to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. They are a walking contradiction in their lives, even though they're not out there in the world. They're not identified with the world. They're identified in the church. They have positions of ministry in the church. They're false teachers in the church. They, you know, carry around Bibles. They wear Christian t-shirts. I mean, these are the people that are false teachers. The hypocrisy, the fruit that they bear is not good. And in the end, it becomes uh, identifiable with thorns and thistles. Well, how can this be? Look at the last part of our verse here. Entangled again, as we saw in Hebrews 6, they are entangled again, this is 2 Peter 2.20, uh, in them, right, in these things that these defilements and overcome, right, they're enslaved, the last state has become worse for them than the first. All I'm saying is that is an incompatible statement with what we read in Scripture about the truly converted. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 3, I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6, and Hebrews chapter 3, verse 14 give a good example of this. It says, but Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. So he's in charge of these people in God's household, truly God's household. And we are his house, right? We are. That's a very important verb, and the tense of that verb is important, the verb to be. We are his house if, conditional clause, we indeed hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. If we hold fast to it, if we continue in it, if we don't look like this person here, who again is entangled in the things that they claim to not be a part of anymore. Or verse 14, same passage, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 14. For we have come to share in Christ. This perfected, in, in grammar, the perfect tense, the idea of this is a reality. You've come to share in Christ if, there's our conditional word, indeed we hold our original confidence, how long? Firm to the end. So these are statements that could read otherwise. You could say, you will come to share in Christ. You will really have a part in Christ's household if you hold to the end. It doesn't say that. It says you have come to share in it. You are truly saved. You have a place in God's family if indeed you hold our original, your original confidence firm to the end. Or in this case, it could say Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and you will be his house, right? If indeed you hold fast your confidence and your hope and your boasting. That statement is not written that way. It's written just the opposite in the sense that you are his house. You are right now his house. And the evidence of that is that you don't become like these people entangled again and overcome in those things. So this is the distinction that is made. And this is the reason why when we look at this passage, the they in this text, it is the false teachers. I think there's ample evidence contextually for that. And it can be true that they have some form of, of, of uh, reformation in their life, some form of positive in their life, some kind of escaping from the defilements, but it's not, it doesn't last. It doesn't, 
It doesn't hold on to the end. It's not something that they hold fast to in the end. They end up being entangled in all these things. It is the apostasy, we would say, of those who come and show signs of life like the soil that's either rocky or thorny and things look good for a while. They receive the word with joy, but then after the difficulties that come because of that, they don't like it. They don't like the self-deprivation. They don't like the struggle. Then they fall away. They are not faithful. And because of that, we know, guess what? They are not part of God's house and they are not sharing in Christ. They are just appearing to. They just have the external appearance of it. So that I hope is helpful. And because this theme is going to recur for the next two verses, we'll be able to get into more of this, which we didn't get into, but hopefully that helps us understand the they and how we can rightly define them and see that fit into the rest of New Testament theology. So back, Lord willing, uh, on Monday as we continue our study through Second Peter. 